All right. Hey there, y'all, and welcome to uh, this month's episode of This is Crucial. Charlene and I are back for another uh, conversation on healing justice and equity and transformation. Uh, as always, our goal is to host conversations that are crucial enough to make us uncomfortable. Charlene, what you been up to recently? Um, I went to Atlanta to actually, I was um, a few miles, I, I don't know, I'm not really good on Georgia geography or s Southern geography really, but I was about, I think, 20 to 30 minutes away from our guest for today who teaches at Emory. I mean, sorry, who teaches at Columbia. Um, and so I was in Atlanta. What about you? Um, been here. Okay. Dallas. Yeah. Just holding it down in Texas. Correct. Well, I didn't really expect for you to ask me the question that I just asked you, so I didn't have an answer ready. But that's okay. Yeah. Um, the folks in Berkeley are going to be real excited about today's guest because a few weeks back we had a conversation about competing Christianities led by one of our local clergy and dear friends, Kamal Hassan and a member Rick Leong. And it was about this book called What Kind of Christianity? A History of Slavery and Anti-Black Racism in the Presbyterian Church. Boom. It's all right there in the title. Uh, this book was written by Dr. William Yu, who, as I said, is a professor, the professor of American Religious and Cultural History and the director of the MDiv program at Columbia Seminary. Uh, Dr. Yu has written about the transnational histories of American Protestant world missions in Korea and Korean American immigrant religious communities. Um, as Amos and I learned, he's even written about my great-grandfather, which was pretty exciting for me to hear. Uh, but his current research is on the histories of racial injustice, settler colonialism, and slavery in the U.S. And this book is hard to read. The histories that he is tracing, um, it's hard to hear, but it's important because it develops muscles that we need to be faithful Christians. And so I'm excited for you all to hear our conversation with William today. Uh, we talk about slavery in the Presbyterian Church. We talk about doctrine of the spirituality of the church. Yep. And we also cover um, when it's okay to be ambivalent. Uh, what people mean when they say, I don't want politics in the church. And we also try to answer the question, why are we still Presbyterian? Thanks, everybody, for joining us for This is Crucial with Dr. William Yu. Enjoy the show. Dr. Yu, welcome to This is Crucial. Well, thank you for the invitation and feel free to call me William. And may I call you and Charlene by your first names too? Yes, you can. of course. Absolutely. Please. Uh, William, what should, uh, what should people know about you before they start reading this book about where you're from, um, who you are? Oh, okay. What Thanks. you're passionate about. Oh, um, I think so. Perhaps I think people should know I am a Presbyterian historian in two ways. One, it is not unlike other academic historians. It is one of the fields in which I have devoted time in study and research, the study and research of Presbyterian and Reformed history. So in that way, I am a Presbyterian historian in the way others might be a post-colonial historian or an African-American studies historian. But in another way, I am a Presbyterian historian because I am a minister of word and sacrament in the Presbyterian Church USA. And I, like both of you, uh, took ordination vows to be a faithful minister, mm. to proclaim the good news, to teach the faith, to care for people. And in my ministry, to try to demonstrate the love and justice of Jesus Christ. So in that way, I suppose in my call as a Presbyterian historian, I want to be clear, um, honest, deep, thorough, and as faithful as possible in the work that I do in any topic, uh, but especially in the topic that is near and dear to my heart, which is Presbyterian history. 
Mm. I mean, not that you need our kind of vote of approval, but let me just say, at least on behalf of First Presbyterian Church of Berkeley, which has been wrestling with your book, What Kind of Christianity, um, your faithfulness has taken you to some pretty intense places writing about the denomination in which you are a minister of and the institution that employs you. And so, I mean, did you, did you set out to write this book? How did the journey take you from your research into, with, into this powerful um, work of history of prophetic writing of justice, all those things. Oh yeah. Thanks, Charlene. Um, so I think as a historian, I am captivated by and interested in writing origin stories hmm. and perhaps even in a, I hope this is in a good sense, self-centered way, where in the world did I come from? Hmm. So when I was a doctoral student at Emory university, one of the things you got to do is first, you got to learn the canon. You got to learn what other people tell you is important in order to teach and write. But then at a certain point, you get to say, this is what I'm going to write in a dissertation that I that we hope eventually one day a lot of people read. By a lot, maybe I mean like triple digits. But initially, it's a committee of three to five people. And so I thought to myself, I really want to write an origin story about Korean American uh, religious history with particular emphasis on Protestantism to help me understand where I came from. What did early Protestant missionaries in the Korean Peninsula do? What were the stories of early Korean American immigrants pre-1965 in the United States? And perhaps how are these stories intertwined? So I told my committee, this is what I wanna do. Some were affirming, and to be honest, some were a little bit like, mm, this, that's a pretty small field, William. <laughs> you might want to write something in a bigger field, in a more established field, because of, you know, chances of publication and it resonating with a broader audience, which will help you in terms of academic job market stuff. And I respectfully, I, I, I thought about it, but to be honest, Amos and Charlene, I thought, like, I might not get another shot to write an academic thing. This might be it for me. <laughs> so why not write this origin story? And I'm grateful that was almost, well, I finished my PhD in 2014, but when I started the dissertation, it was about a dozen years ago. And Korean American Christian history has developed and it has grown since then. So that's a good thing. So then fast forward a few years, I thought, what's the next kind of book project I want to do? And it really was, I want to learn more about Presbyterianism. Like where in the world did we come from? And in particular, what, what strivings, what successes, what struggles and what failures have Presbyterians uh, enacted uh, and embodied in racial justice? So why, why do Presbyterians and other mainstream denominations too, why do we struggle so much with something that seems so obvious in terms of following the gospel and biblical principles, right. equality of all people. Uh, God does not judge us by our skin color. So from there, I thought, I really want to write a history of race and racism in American Presbyterianism. So I'm sorry, I'm, I'm kind of going off some. But so really, I thought that was going to be, I was going to write from the colonial period, the early Scots and Scotch-Irish Presbyterian immigrants, up until maybe even the present day, I thought try to cover the span of 300 years in a helpful um, book that would be accessible. So that was initially what I talked about with Westminster John Knox Press and my editor there. And they said, that's great. Why don't you go for it? And then um, as I started doing it, uh, within maybe a year, year and a half in, I found myself dissatisfied, Charlene and Amos, with treatments of slavery. Hmm. Oftentimes they were if at most given a chapter, and in the chapters in the history books that I was consulting, it was really treated as an abstract theological debate or like a disagreement about biblical interpretation. See, the real problem with American Presbyterians in the 18th and 19th centuries were that they didn't read the Bible correctly or some mm -hmm. were too literal in how they interpreted, for example, 
uh, passages in the Pauline epistle, slaves obey your masters. They didn't have the sophisticated hermeneutical tools that we have today. Uh, This was before historical critical methods of biblical interpretation, which emerged in the late 19th century, or they got caught up in paragraph upon paragraph about how different white Presbyterian men, theologians and pastors, were interpreting certain verbs or words in the Hebrew Bible or Greek New Testament. Doulos, the word for either servant or slave in the New Testament. And I just thought, I was just really dissatisfied. This can't be the whole story. And so I started studying it more. And from there, I became like, I think this is the book I want to write, to really understand not only Presbyterianism, but to really understand slavery, to understand slavery and its intricacies. Not so much the Hebrew and Greek parsing and verbs, but what really was slavery? Like what really were slave auctions? What really was the problems with family separation and sexual violence that were rampant in American slavery? And how did Presbyterians reflect upon those things in addition to biblical interpretation? And that's where it evolved and emerged. So I can ask you all, like, what did you all know about the history of slavery in the Presbyterian church, uh, even two years ago or three years ago or after seminary? Do you know what I mean by my question? I'm just curious. Not much. Yes, absolutely not much. I mean, if anything, I started to learn when... um, in recent years when, you know, names of buildings, like I went to Princeton Theological Seminary, started being questioned, like, should we change the name of this building? I'm on the board of SFTS. Should we change the name? Because, you know, so-and-so professor or president of the seminary was a slave owner, but um, nothing to this extent. Mm-hmm. And when, um, so we did a, a converse, uh, an adult ed event around this, around, around your book with the Reverend Kamal Hassan from Sojourner Truth in Richmond and one of our members, Rick Leong, who is, we, who we have to thank for, um, um, for you being a guest on this show. Um, the faces in the congregation, I mean, just jaws dropping at recounting and reading some of the things because it was just, it's never been told as a part of our story. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Me neither. I, I did not have, um, I didn't go to a Presbyterian seminary at all. And even if I did, I don't think they would have offered this history. So, um, yeah, this was, uh, it, it was, uh, it was my first journey into this history, uh, was through, through reading your work, Dr. Yi. Um, and it, it, I, I'm very interested in uh, how you started the book. Um, and you started with a quotation, a quote or a question that um, Katie Geneva Cannon, uh, theologian and, and um, uh, pastor, um, I think she's Presbyterian pastor, um, asked. And uh, the question was, uh, what kind of Christianity allowed white Christians to deny basic human rights and simple dignity to blacks? And uh you take the title of the book from that question, what kind of Christianity allowed white Christians to deny basic human rights to blacks? And your answer was um, very surprising. Uh, and uh, I'm interested to hear you unpack it. You said um, that uh, it was the Presbyterian kind of Christianity. Um, can you say more about that? What do you mean by that? Oh, thanks, Amos. Um, so one is, I do think there is consensus that perhaps the one right answer to Dr. Katie Geneva Cannon's question is the wrong kind of Christianity. Mm. And I do think in some church history classes that is presented as such. Taking seriously, for example, Frederick Douglass's 1845 autobiographical narrative published only years after he escaped enslavement himself in Maryland, where he compares genuine Christianity with American slaveholding Christianity, and he calls it corrupt, slaveholding, a woman whipping, cradle plundering, partial and hypocritical Christianity. So that's the wrong kind of Christianity. Um, But I think that is actually, while helpful, not as historically precise as we need to understand and take seriously uh, Presbyterian 
participation, complicity, and active perpetuation of slavery and anti-Black racism. So why I say Amos, the Presbyterian kind of Christianity, is to look at how Presbyterians in congregations, Presbytery synods, general assemblies, uh, seminaries, and other church-related institutions, like, what did they do? How did they act? What did they profess? So, okay, a few levels. One is, so I affirm the work of other historians who note that Presbyterian clergy published more pro-slavery sermons, treatises, writings, and sermons than clergy of any other tradition in uh, North American colonies, United States. And to note the inaction at the General Assembly, uh, to note the ways in which, I think one comparison helps, and then I'll stop there, is to, to look at Methodist, Baptist, and Presbyterians, uh, the three largest kind of mainstream Presbyterian denominations in the United States at the eve of the Civil War. Um, and to note that Methodists and Baptists uh, did split uh, in 1844 and 1845, um, to note that for Methodists, uh, it's not to say that all Methodists were abolitionists. And in fact, likely among Protestants, very few were for the immediate emancipation of enslaved persons. There were other, and we can talk about kind of other kind of compromises and reforms, such as uh, the colonization movement to send both free and enslaved African Americans to Liberia. But the, you know, what happened was uh, in Georgia, a white man, a pastor, uh, was became appointed, elected as a bishop. And enough white Northern Methodists said, "No, he has he has inherited enslaved persons through marriage. We can't have him be responsible for leadership and oversight." So, over James Good Osgood Andrews' kind of uh, election or appointment to bishop, they divided. Uh, Baptists divided in 1845 because a sufficient number of Northern white Baptists said, look, we can't be commissioning uh, world missionaries, uh, ministers to go out into the world to proclaim the gospel if they are enslavers. And of course, white Southern Baptists said, no, you can't do that. So they divided. Uh, and so when you look at Presbyterians, though, there was no such division uh, especially in the largest mainstream Presbyterian denomination until 1861. Mm. Uh, right, actually one month after the first shots were fired at Fort Sumter in the U.S. Civil War. Mm. So what I found is Presbyterians were in fact deeply committed to ecclesial unity, but ecclesial unity, what that meant was they were deeply committed to preserving and perpetuating slavery, mm. to keep the denomination united. So, and I'll end here with this. I know I, I probably said that already. So, so I found other treatments of Presbyterian history as divided. It's a church divided. Um, abolitionists on one side, pro-slavery Presbyterians on the other. But that's actually, I think, not true. It was actually a denomination united. United to drive out, whether by force for some too out to drive out abolitionists who are too outspoken or really by continued compromises and inaction to really drive out others who were just dissatisfied with the immorality so that the denomination could remain united. Um, and and uh, what was the doctrines? What did they profess? Hmm. Yeah. So really, even after 1845, when you look at or what I've looked at the General Assembly minutes, there really was an intentional strategic effort to appoint moderate, elect moderators, uh, temporary stated clerks, stated clerks, who gets to pray, who gets to preach, who gets to be chairs of committees. There was a concerted effort, though the denomination was probably three quarters uh, Northern membership to have enslavers and supporters of slavery be in these prominent leadership positions. So when you look at that, you have to say the Presbyterian kind of Christianity, and I say this in a sober way and as honest as possible, was responsible for the perpetuation of slavery. 
there really was no division when you look at the Presbyterian Church, capital C. What, can, can you talk more about what happened in 1861 when, when the church did, uh, did split? Um, can you give us a, a quick narrative history of um, Oh, I of can try time? to give you some. And um, so, so it really is beginning in the 1830s, what's known as the second wave of abolitionism, uh, where beginning really in the late 1820s, uh, there were more stirrings and more uh, at the state level, local level, and national level, more emancipatory movements. Some note the, the publication of the Liberator newspaper with William Lloyd Garrison, I think January 1, 1831. Others note Freedom's Journal, the first black abolitionist newspaper uh, with one of the editors, uh, Samuel Eli Cornish, a black Presbyterian pastor in New York City. Um, others note the American Anti-Slavery Society, which was also founded in the first half of the 1830s. So a lot was going on. There was more of a consciousness nationally to support uh, abolition and the eradication of slavery. And so with that came in the Presbyterian Church also some abolitionists within the Presbyterian Church USA that were motivated and wanting the denomination to take a firmer stand. Mm -hmm. At one level, one Presbyterian, the Chillicothe Presbyterian in Ohio, said one thing we can do is, in our polity, we can say, if you are an enslaver, you cannot take the Lord's Supper or communion. Um, so uh, this was all going on. So really all of this came ahead even before 1861, Amos, at the 1836 General Assembly. Mm -hmm. uh, where there were stirrings. There was, in part because in 1835, I think 198 persons signed a memorial to say, hey, the PCUSA needs to take a firmer stand, not just on slavery, but for abolition. But, but at that General Assembly in 1836, ultimately, what was decided was an indefinite postponement. Yeah. So, yeah. and it actually ended up dissatisfying both abolitionists and pro-slavery Presbyterians. Neither were actually satisfied with right. this compromise measure. So abolition is obviously unsatisfied because it's like an immoral stance. Uh, we have to say something more. But pro-slavery Presbyterians in the Southern states, they were also dissatisfied because, hey, are you with us or are you against us? We yeah. want to denounce the abolitionists because they are saying we are anti-Christian to the core. So you've got to make a stand. So that's really where it began. And ultimately from 1836 all the way through until 1861, it, it was this tension that they were trying to navigate. And ultimately, in a way, the pro-slavery Presbyterian position won. Yeah. By Which is, yes. And that to me is the, the fascinating part of that, that history in the early 19th century with Presbyterians is that in 1818, um, the, the General Assembly uh, uh, I think passed a measure or resolution or uh, uh, made a, uh, uh, approved a theological statement saying that, you know, the enslavement of people is a gross violation of human rights. Um, and, uh, is an, I don't know if it was an abomination, but is inconsistent with, um, the, the practices of, of, uh, of Christianity. So that in 1818, there was a definitive sort of line drawn in the sand, um, not in the sand, but I guess it'd be the concrete or whatever, but, um, uh, and then yet still, it seems like it was being, it continued to be litigated, that question, if the General Assembly had already um, uh, uh, clarified the church's position on the, um, uh, on uh, slavery being a, a violation of human rights, why did it take so long, you know, to affirm that conclusion in the church's actions? What is it about being Presbyterian is what I'm trying to say um, that that continually leads us to make to to to, to uh, uh, make theological statements, you know, which is something we still tend to do is we're really good at, you know, passing resolutions and making, you know, clarifying our theological position. Um, is that distinctly Presbyterian? 
or is uh, is that a feature of um, uh, of of just people and, and institutions at large? Oh, thanks, Amos. I don't know. Um, I think so. In that same resolution from eighteen eighteen, there are exhortations uh, of forbearance to avoid harsh censure, criticism, or words toward enslavers. Um, So there is, while saying slavery is inconsistent with the spirit of the gospel, a gross violation of human rights, there is also that impulse that has existed throughout American Presbyterian history to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. And it is the... Press, you said it, uh, it is both the promise and peril of trying to do church together. Mm-hmm. So even now, when we look at the Presbyterian Church USA, some will say it's a leaning progressive denomination. Some will say it's a moderate denomination. I think depending on how you view it and where you live and what kind of church you are worshiping in. But in reality, it is actually, I think, we are all three of us in a denomination with less moderates, like people who are genuinely moderate or genuinely like, I'm not really sure on this issue or that issue. I'm really open to this position or that position, but really in some ways it's a denomination of maybe one third to 40% of people who are pretty convinced that more conservative approaches theologically and politically are the way to uh, promote flourishing and justice. And another one third to 40% of people of faith who are convinced that the progressive ways of thinking, including policies, are the way to promote justice and flourishing. And maybe at most, right? Uh, A fourth to 20% who are genuinely like, on one thing, I'm going to go one way, and another thing, I'm going to go another way. So then, Amos, what you have is, we ha- you have all of us trying to live together. And so that's, so I don't mean to make that analogy between the 1830s, 40s, and 50s, and today. That's more a contemporary observation. So that is one thing about Presbyterianism today, that we have diverse people, diverse viewpoints that are all trying to grapple and live and struggle together in faith. And if we're really honest, one part of why we are trying to live together and struggle in faith is not only because of our theology, but because of our polity. It is because it's in uh, governance. Is it G4, 0203? Church property is held in trust. Hmm. That a congregational building does not belong to the congregation, but it belongs to the presbytery, synod, or general assembly. So it is very difficult for congregations to leave the PCUSA. So we're figuring out how to do all this. I think, so that's something about Presbyterianism. So I do think, and maybe we can talk some and I'll ask you all. One thing I want to share is that I think in the antebellum period, um, it was the economic centrality of slavery and its foundational roots that really did um, influence, and again, this is an explanation, not an excuse, but influence white Presbyterians to be what some noted back then, they are anti-slavery, but also anti-abolition, right? That they really understand slavery is wrong and they wish it would go away, but they are also against abolition because they are worried about the uh, the, the social changes that would come from an economy that was both in the southern and northern states so dependent upon enslaved labor. Yeah. Um, so you had that. So there was a real suspicion and a real antipathy toward the kind of social changes uh, that would disrupt foundational realities. And what do you all think? Do you see that today in in your congregations or in just the Presbyterian ministries that you participate and lead that kind of concern about social change and the, the, the what if, and how will this 
disrupt our lives, our neighborhoods, our congregations, etc. I mean, yeah, absolutely. We did a, a conference on climate change and climate justice. And um, what I appreciated is one of the presenters went, um, you know, so much of it was uh, research, meta, all these things. And like, you know, this is the rate in which our world is dying and just in destruction. And then you had someone who was like, okay, these are the things you can do to slow down the rate of the deterioration of God's creation. And one of them was like, take one less transatlantic flight a year. And you're, I'm, I mean, I'm looking at my mom who loves to travel and she was just like, like it was just like um, stop ordering stuff on Amazon. Like all of these things which feel less high stakes than participating in the slave trade, right? And so we're kind of giving ourselves a pass, but absolutely holding these values um, at, a, at a big scale and talking about it and preaching about it. I'm guilty of all of these things. I order I almost ordered your book from Amazon. Instead, I got it from, I think, like Cokesbury or something like that. Um, but yeah, it's it's rampant. It's, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, people like to be around other people who are like them, you know? So, um, and yet still we uh, end up with, I mean, churches like the one I serve where I would describe us as a um, uh, politically and theologically, probably more politically than theologically diverse congregation. Um, and uh, I try not to use the the common term for that, which is, you know, that we're a purple church. Um, I don't know... Uh, and the reason I don't say we're a purple church is because it's oftentimes you say that and, and it in what people mean by that when they say we're a purple church is like, don't do anything to disturb the purple. You know, like this is a, we like this color. It's um, it's a way to um, avoid, you know, um, conversations to, you know, say this is a, this is a purple church. So I don't know. Um a badge of yeah. honor because yeah. I think we love our diversity, we do. right? I mean, it's a cultural value, diversity outside the church, inside the church. And so, but what I, what I hear in Amos's question and your answers too, is like, what comes at the cost of, of trying to maintain that diversity in the name of unity? Yeah. And it means saying a lot of things, but not doing necessarily doing the hard thing. Right. And you said it's not only it's our polity, it's also our theology. Right. Is it the fact that we're like total depravity, we don't trust anything. So we're so reticent to make any kind of a human origin decision because we're like, well. Oh, yeah. You know, so I do. So while I was writing the book um, and I was just talking to people about it, actually, one of the things that were suggested to me is. It's probably because Presbyterians were reformed people of faith. Okay. And it was probably the theology. Um, but then w when I really thought about it and I looked at both pro-slavery writing and abolitionist criticism of pro-slavery uh, kind of theology, I, in fact, the abolitionist accusation really was that the reformed tradition does inform a kind of anti-institutionalism a suspicion of monarchy, a suspicion of tyranny, a suspicion of anything that uh, will disturb freedom of liberty or liberty of conscience. And that, look, reform people in Geneva and then particularly in Scotland, which for some uh, early American Presbyterianism, Presbyterians was the, the mother or, or parent church. It, it was a church, it was a reform tradition that was deeply motivated to resist tyranny and mm -hmm. also one that was to promote um, change, social change. And again, part of the argument when you have Geneva with John Calvin and then John Knox and Scotland and that history was they were established uh, church and state. It was kind of united in one. It was in some ways a theocracy. So 
so so then you kind of come to the United States and really it was like we some American Presbyterian abolition were saying we need to really tap into that reform tradition and we need to do likewise. We need to stand uh, for the oppressed and we need to really seek uh, institutional systematic change. And others would say, actually, no, you know, we're not a theocracy. We're actually a democracy. It doesn't work that way. And so there we can talk about it some. It really became this kind of apolitical position that became known in Presbyterianism in the United States as the doctrine of the spirituality of the church. Mm-hmm. That kind of linking to another part of Reformed history, like uh, churches should be separate from politics because politics corrupts. And really what churches do best are preaching, proclamation, teaching of the word and offering sacraments. For us in our tradition, it is baptism and the Lord's Supper. So we should not get involved in political movements. But if we can do word and sacrament well, all of the people in our churches, they will be instructed and nurtured well so that they can make the political decisions that they need to outside of the church. So we can stay pure. Um, so I, I do think, um, but to note, and I think we can have healthy dialogue, if not even disagreement and debate on that doctrine. But for me as a historian, Charlene and Amos, I want to know where that came from. Yeah. The root of that doctrine was to defend slavery. Jeez. Like certainly we can say, maybe some who disagree with me, you can tell I'm not for this doctrine. But even if another Presbyterian disagreed with me, Perhaps their argument might be, yes, it came from slavery, but here's how it's evolved. But I find that's actually not how the debate goes. It is a kind of ahistorical debate that totally ignores the roots of where it came from. And in fact, I'm not the only one. There were several in the 1850s and in the 1950s and 60s during the civil rights movement who were saying this doctrine of the spirituality of the church is actually a betrayal of the reformed tradition. Mm -hmm. It is antagonistic to early modern Europe and how it all developed. So I would love for us to talk about it. I I wanted to ask you too, with the idea of kind of politically diverse churches, one thing I find challenging in our American context is for example, I've heard some say to our church and me as a minister, I'm gonna be political, but not partisan. Maybe Mm -hmm. you've heard that too. Yes. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to try to figure out how to engage like civil dialogue. And I think that's all true and good. One challenge to me is that we live in a two party political system that is inherently partisan to some degree. I don't want to say like super hyper partisan and hatred of one another, but it really is on every matter. They're really, if it's a multiple choice test, there's really only A and B. I know sometimes we can say CDE, but ultimately CDE don't. Yeah, it's so then how do you work in congregations that can help people be like fully engaged and informed and even to say, look, you're going to have to pick A or B. So we're going to try to study the issues. And on some topics, perhaps the Republican candidate is better. And when looking at justice and you can't get everything in other ways, the Democratic candidate would be better. And so we're going to do that. And but I actually think that that sometimes I wonder if that's like a pipe dream. I don't know where that really happens in churches. I don't know. I, I don't know if you all have children. So I've got a 14 and 12 year old now turning 15, my oldest. In a few years, it's like uh, my, my eldest kid is going to get the right to vote. And it's like a super big deal. And my eldest kid is super excited about it. And we're excited about it. But then it's odd to me, like to go to church. And no, 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 we're never going to talk about that. Right. We're, gonna, we're never going to talk about one of the most sacred, holy, beautiful things that you get to do as an American adult. Hmm. And so we're, so I wonder how we can have like healthy conversations because politics is just a foundational reality of our lives. It's like the fish swimming in water. And someone oh. says, how's the water? And the fish are like, what's water? Yeah. It's just because nothing happens apart from politics. It's also, I mean, when Presbyterians say, you know, let's keep politics out of the church, I'm like, 
we are political. Like our our system of governance, you know, our model for church governance is inherently political. I mean, we elect, you know, elders. We we elect people to nominating committees. We um uh we have term limits, you know, for for our elders and for our members of our committees, and and um, they're often just two choices when you know we've got to take action. It's either yes or no. You know, um, we build coalitions um, to, to to encourage the church to act in particular ways. We choose, um, you know, represented. We we have we are rep. The bodies represented. The whole community is represented by people that are particularly um, called. You know, to uh, be ruling elders and teaching elders in the church. But in, you know, so I'm like, it's we do politics here all the time, just nonstop. I mean, I don't know if there, if we, so, and yet still, I mean, I, I, I don't, I, I hear that a lot more now than, uh, hear what? I, and like, it, it, let's, let's keep politics out of the pulpit or, um, the church is getting too political or, you know, I'm just, I, maybe I'm a, you know, um, I'm tuned into it now more than I have been in the past, but, um, I definitely hear it more so now um than i than i used to and um yeah i um and i think that means different things to different people when they say that you know i don't let's let's not have politics in church or rather than come to church to um uh to be political and so that's something i've been reflecting on as of late is like what are the different like how are people defining that differently you know um so yeah, I mean, to answer your question about is, can we have these conversations within our church or is that a pipe dream? I mean, I was really convicted by all that doctrine of, what was it, spirituality? Yeah, of the church, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've said that exact line about part, part not partisan, but political, like, and and have been, have found it really hard to navigate. Um, I mean, I lit, we, I'm not in Georgia or um, Texas. California is like a pretty deeply entrenched blue state, um, but its politics are very complicated. And so um, to talk about a candidate means talking about all the, like I can promote a candidate, but then there's like a weird side issue. Like politics has just become so complicated. So to talk about individuals over issues, I feel like is, um, a disaster waiting to happen because it's all hidden. Like this person supports maybe eight things that as a Christian I support and then two things that are kind of like sketchy and da, 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 da. And so I would say how we as a church are in our own very imperfect way trying to address things that impact us, AKA politics is talking about issues that would then drive um, how we vote. I mean, it's exactly what you said, which then kind of makes me feel sheepish. It's like, we're going to do all of that work so that by the time we release you into the world, you have everything you need to do to vote your conscience as a Christian. Um, but I, yeah, I'm, it's, I, all that to say, William, I, I'm not doing it well. I don't know. I feel very ill-equipped. Yeah. I mean, in that regard, as a professor at a seminary, I'm really interested in what today's seminarians are coming in, asking for, looking for, expecting from a seminary education training to become, to go into churches. Like this book was not available when I was in seminary. And so your students have access to this and you in a way that I'm like, that's amazing. So are you seeing that there's a hunger amongst your students to get more political, to get like, is this, are they saying it's not an option? We want to talk about this or are they still kind of just like unity of the church? Oh yeah, Charlene. I, that's a good question. I, of course there are lots of different answers because there are lots of different students. Right. Um, you're, I think, um, me too. I think part of what took me longer to write the book than I wanted, and probably more my editor wanted, if I'm being totally honest, is it was in some ways writing a history that I never learned. Mm. Um, 
so I do. So a few things. One is I do think. Um, I do think uh, the teaching and learning of Christian history and Presbyterian history needs to get a lot better. Um, in this part, I think, uh, and this is how I was grew up, nurtured, and raised too, like. Um, like Christian history, and I think this is happening, quite frankly, with U.S. history, too. And we can talk some about the ways these are colliding and conflating. It really is a story or a past where we're looking for role models. We're looking for witnesses, uh, uh, women, men, people of faith who really inspire us and who really challenge and convict us to do good, act justly, and, and all of that. And I think that's good. We need certainly role models and history needs to provide that for us. But if that's all that's providing for us, it actually isn't giving us a real honest, full view of the past and where we came from. So that when we learn hard things, we learn about in the church, but also in the United States, the moral contradictions between the democratic principles and the enslaving practices of the founding political leaders of this country. It really, and then the church too, it really it really throws some people off. Like that can't be it. Like that can't be what it means or how the United States came to be or how the Presbyterian church in the United States came to be. And so we do need to figure out ways to like better prepare students from the ground up. So that I liken it to like, I don't do a lot of weightlifting. I tried to do a little bit with the dumbbells, you know, the 10 pound. Well, I'm going to be honest, the seven pound things I started with <laughs> and I, uh, five, seven, 10. And I got up to like 15, 20. But then one day a friend of mine was like, we're at the YMCA before the pandemic and let's do the bench press, you know, and let's try to do it. And I was totally inequipped. I think it was just a hundred pounds. Yeah, maybe a little bit more with the bar. And I, I just, I didn't know how to do it. I could not bench press it. It was so painful. I didn't have the muscles to do it. Mm -hmm. And why I share that, Charlene and Amos, is I do think people of faith and even some Americans don't have the muscles yep. to really grapple with the hard truths about nationalism, about faith, about democracy, and some of the broken promises and uh, contradictory realities of faith and democracy. So we need to do that. I think um, I think another challenge my students and I talk about, and I think Amos, you and Charlene are are good kind of um, mentors for my students in this regard. Like, how can a congregation or worship church? How can it be a, a space that both provides comfort and challenge? Yeah, like sometimes people are coming to church. And some of my students and I talk about this because they've had a really hard week and there's a lot of pain going on. So it doesn't feel like that's the moment on Sunday morning to kind of convict everyone. Hey, we're not doing enough to follow the call of the gospel. Do you know what Bonhoeffer said about discipleship? It doesn't feel like that's the moment. Mm -hmm. like, how do you know when to comfort? And I, I, you've heard this too. I think it's a, it's a kind of poet thing. How do you know when to afflict? Right? right. How do you know when to comfort the afflicted? How do you know when to afflict the comfortable? Right. And so much of our, I feel like our church DNA and the Presbyterian church and other Protestant denominations, it actually, like, there's not a lot of, using my bench press analogy, there's actually not a lot of, like, in the bones to do the affliction and the challenging. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, like uh, if we're honest, I think sometimes people want to come to church to be comforted. And that's okay. But then it's not okay when it just becomes to be comfortable, right? right? Like, so how do you do that? How do you, how do you figure out how to lead in a way that's like effective and doesn't feel like I'm pushing too hard or I'm not pushing enough? Yeah, you can't do it if you don't know the people that you've been called to lead, to serve with and beside. So there's no book really, I mean, that you can pick up. There's no seminar or conference you can go to. I mean, to be able to know, like, you know, when to uh, move faster and when to slow down and when, you know, to be able to read um, uh, 
you know, read the room in the sanctuary and um, to be able to sense, you know, what's happening in the community um, in a particular week or in a particular month. You have to know, you have to know your community. You have to know the people. You have to love them. You actually have to love them deeply. And if you don't take time to um, not just learn how to love them, but also learn how to receive their love, then, you know, proclamation is just, you know, it's just a, um, it's just an exercise, you know, in uh, a, a mechanical exercise as opposed to a, um, um, a communal experience. So, and I think that's the hard, like for me, I, I don't know seminary students that well these days. I don't know what, what's happening on seminary campuses. Um, but, um, I, I, I'm a, a principal fear of mine, uh, as it relates to the church is we, we're, we would be becoming experts at, um, at um, nurturing and 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 uh, building up leaders who are have have a very strong p- prophetic voice, especially in the public square, you know, um, and uh, um, and really m- maybe even have gifts for being like a public theologian, um, and and yet congregational, like, are we are we equipping our seminarians for like the nitty gritty like slow mundane um parts of pastoral leadership where you know like the door is closed and you're holding somebody's hand while they're weeping and they're grieving the death of their you know 98 year old mother or father and you know can you stay there in that moment which is i think where where you build the um um, you establish the, um, um, like the authority to be able to get up in a pulpit and afflict people. Yep. If they don't know you love them, I mean, right. Um, it doesn't matter. You have all the most be- you know, really beautiful words and, um, yeah. and have a really like a booming voice and, um, you know, do a lot of movements and stuff and won't matter. I mean, this is where I would say is interesting in terms of maybe the history as we talk about origin stories. And I think some of the histories that um, the three of us have inherited as Presbyterian ministers is like definitely this, um, the primacy of the word, right, of scripture. Um, And then from that came the primacy of the preached or proclaimed word, right? Like it's our our worship services are built around it. I would definitely stand next with my music director and agree with our music director and say um, that music stands alongside the proclamation of the word, the liturgy, the music. But in in this kind of intellectual culture, um, the proclamation becomes the method, the vehicle of exactly what you're talking about, either comforting or afflicting. And the deeper I've gone into ministry, the more I take issue with how much the pulpit is on a pedestal. Mm -hmm. So everything that Amos is saying, it's like we keep on coming back to how do we use that, those 15, depending on how you, how long you preach, 20, 12 to 25 minutes to do all that work. You can't, you shouldn't. In fact, I read a really good blog about Lent. In Lent, preach less, talk less. Like this is where we should be contemplating and praying and shutting up. And yet our tradition as Presbyterians is read more, talk more, blah, more, right? Um, And so that's the real discipline for me um, because on any given Sunday, if I preach either a very hopeful sermon or a very challenging one, it's going to be split in the pews what people need. Some of those people will need to be comforted. Some of those people want to be afflicted. And, you know, and then it's personality. It's not even seasonal. It's like some people just always want the to-do. And some people always want the affirmation. Yeah. Um, and so if in that small portion of my job that requires me to get up into the pulpit, it's what does the text say, right? Because if it's pushing you in a direction to afflict, like how can you not go in that direction? I mean, obviously there's moments like California had 
in pretty rapid succession, those two mass shootings. Um, and that's when I would say we rest in the music and the liturgy and not, it doesn't always have to be the sermon that does all the quote unquote spiritual formation or work. Um, but I don't think our tradition has been very good about making us well-rounded Christians. Mm -hmm. And, and, and this is a part of modernity as well. We love, we're Amazon people. We love our things fast. We want our church in an hour. And I mean, I, I want my church in an hour. I don't like a service longer than an hour. Mm -hmm. Um, but how are we doing that comforting and afflicting Monday through Saturday as well mm -hmm. as a church? How are we building those practices or those converse, those muscles? Exactly that, William, those muscles, because gosh, we are, we're so weak on that, mm -hmm. on that front. And also um, in, 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 I'm sorry, go ahead, Charlie. No, no. And I just wanted to add on to what you were saying and say, and also in what ways are we, you know, as, as, um, as preachers and as pastors um, positioning ourselves throughout the week so that we might be afflicted by what, mm -hmm. by the proclamation of the, of the community as well. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, have, have we made ourselves vulnerable in such a way, yep. and positioned ourselves in such a place that um, we might also be afflicted yeah. um, because of um, feedback or critique or, or an invitation or, you know, um, uh, to go somewhere, or do something or participate or share in something. So, yeah. All right. Well, I have a final question for us. And it was the question that was on everyone's mind at the end of the conversation about your book. Um, and um, I'm, I don't know if you know the Reverend Kamal Hassan, um, William, Dr. Yu, you should. Uh, he, he did justice to your book um, and said the hard thing so much so that the, at the end of the conversation, um, the lingering question was, why are we Presbyterian? <laughs> like if, if what kind of Christianity is, if the answer to that question is a Presbyterian one, at what point do we say, yikes, um, and, and leave the denomination or leave the history or I don't know. And so that's my question to you. So having written this book, um, about the institution in which you work in, the denomination which you serve in, um, why do you continue forth as a Presbyterian minister of the Word and Sacrament, as a professor um, at Columbia Seminary? Oh, yeah. Thanks, Charlene. And I, I know of uh, Reverend Kamal Hassan, and uh, we've been rectangle boxes on Zoom together. Okay, uh, before great. in the past, but unfortunately, we've never met in 3D or four. Okay. I don't know what it is in person, but um, yeah. I think that is a good question. And I don't know if uh, Reverend Kamal Hassan said this, but I think it is a question that many Presbyterians of color have asked themselves many times. I am reminded of Gayrod Wilmore who wrote Black and Presbyterian and was involved, one of the leaders in the civil rights movement and one of the leaders in the, then it was called the UPC USA, the United Presbyterian Church in the United States of America, 60s and 70s. And it was hard. He, he made a lot of progress, got a lot of backlash. And he says Black Presbyterians are ambivalent about Presbyterianism, but not ambiguous. And the point I think he's trying to make there is ambiguous implies a kind of uncertainty. I, I don't really know why I'm doing this, but I'm going to keep doing it. But ambivalent actually is I'm clear about what I love and I'm clear about what I want to discard and what I oppose and what is not useful and what is not helpful to me. So I can be ambivalent about, for some people, quite frankly, I'm ambivalent about my family, extended family. I know what I love about them and I know where there is some danger. I'm ambivalent about this and that. And I think that kind of ambivalence is healthy. Uh, I think it's to say, this is what I love and appreciate about being Presbyterian. So for me, I will say I belong, I am a minister member of an imperfect denomination, but it is 
the denomination where I believe I can best serve God and enact justice, love, grace, and righteousness. Mm. That doesn't mean I'm always in love with the PCUSA, but this is where I believe God is called, and this is where I believe I can do God's work the best. So I am ambivalent. And I think that kind of, I, I think what's hard, Amos and Charlene, is quite frankly, some Presbyterians have never had to have that, wrestle with that kind of ambivalence before. So again, to use my bench press analogy, it feels like you're saying lift this hundred pounds when you've never done anything on the dumbbells, let alone on the bench. Right. So that is in part, so I, I and the one other thing I'll say about that is I do think also Presbyterians would be helped, I guess, and I feel bad I'm getting on a soapbox a little bit, by learning how to receive both the heroism and criticism of, for example, Black Presbyterians and other Black and white abolitionists. Like they were heroes of faith. Um, Theodore S. Wright, the first Black graduate of Princeton Seminary, class of 1828, he is a hero of faith. Um, some of the early women who really broke stained glass ceilings, Margaret Towner, uh, Rachel Henderlight, uh, Katie Geneva Cannon. But it is, in addition to their heroism, how do we also take seriously and learn from their criticism? Mm. Right? They were deeply heroic pioneers, and a pioneering journey is inherently hard. But they also had deep criticisms of the church that they belonged to and served. So we, too, have to be able to engage the criticism past, present, and future. So I think that's one way, I think, why I stay Presbyterian and how we can stay Presbyterian. I think what's a totally unhelpful pathway is to pretend that there is no criticism, to take yeah. any kind of ambivalence and say, no, 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 that's not for me. That's not how I am going to be a person of faith. And I think that happens too. And that to me is a pretty unfruitful way to do it. Sadly, I think you can get you can get pretty far that way in some pockets of the Presbyterian Church, capital C. But I just, I don't know how effective it is. I don't know how genuine it is. Um, yeah, so I'll leave with that. I hope that's helpful. I don't know how you all think about all of that. That's, I mean, that's actually pretty pretty right on to what Kamal said. I mean, he he did not leave for the possibility that he would never leave the Presbyterian Church. What he said right now, this is where I feel I can serve the best and um, where God is calling me to be. And there's enough here that's keeping me um, that outweighs the things that I am ambivalent about. Or um, so, no, I I so appreciate that. I. You know, I appreciate the courage I imagine it took. I don't want to to define your experience for you, but to write this book. Um, and so I deeply uh, feel challenged and pastored by this conversation. So thank you so much for your the hours of research and then taking that research and turning it to, into – um, what I feel is like a very thoughtful critique. And um, my hope and prayer is that we, through stuff like this, through conversations like this, we can um, together build that muscle as a community where we can have these hard conversations. So thank you so much. Thank you, William. All right. Thank it's you been all. great to have you on here. Thanks, Amos. Thanks, Charlene. Right. It's been a delight for me too. <laughs>